Okay, so yeah, in case you're not aware, my name's Roger and I'm doing this little European arguments sort of series. Um, done one on the money issue, taking money. Uh, just done one on centralization, decentralization. And this one is about going to the people. Uh, I'm calling it that. <laughs> um, and it came, this has come out of doing these talks around uh, Europe that I've just come back from and some of the discussions I've had. And dare I say, it's probably the most important one. I mean, they're all important, okay? But if I had to choose one, this, is, this is, might be it. Might change my mind, but anyway. So why is this the most important one? Okay, so I was going around Europe, you know, went to Amsterdam, went to Brussels, went to Paris, you know, 200 people, whatever, and they all come in. And what I notice immediately is, well, they're all great people, right? Let me say that, right? You can tell they're great people, they're really animated, they're really serious, but also from only one, broadly speaking, only one cultural group, which is urban, educated, liberal stroke radical, okay? Um, very competent, fantastic, but there's a big problem, which is, with all due respect, they are not the demographic that are going to transform the global economy. Okay, the demographic that's going to change them is the common people. Okay, that's not a very exact phrase, so I'm going to come on to that in a minute. But let's just put that out there. So, what am I talking about here? What I'm talking about is what in the political literature is called the paradox of political identity. And it's the single biggest problem in social movement building. And arguably, it's the, or at least a central problem in the whole of politics. And it goes a bit like this, which is, you know, crap things are happening, so you want to do something about it. So what you do is you go to a meeting and there's other people like you there because, you know, there's people from a similar demographic that are worried about it, like, let's say, educated urban people. Not all of them, but let's say 1% of them. Um, so that's great. So you have your meeting, everyone's sort of like you, you get on, you've been to the same university, you like the same music, you know, you have the same sort of cultural attitudes. Fantastic, you're all mates, you wanna go again. So you're going again the following week and it gets bigger and it builds up to say 100 people and it's fantastic and you're all the same. And the reason it builds so fast is because everyone's culturally sim similar, you talk in a similar way, have the same sort of etiquette, you know. This isn't just about politics, it's deeper than that, but obviously everyone's, let's say, broadly left-wing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that's great. But the paradox is the extent to which you're successful through building a social movement, through getting everyone like me to join it, you are unsuccessful in taking it to the next stage. Because at a certain point, you're gonna run out of urban, sensible, educated people, and that's it, you're gonna stay there. And you're not going to get onto the other demographics. But it's worse than that, it's when the other demographics come into that space, they immediately feel alienated. So this can apply to sort of, you know, people of color or whatever, you know, marginalized people within the city, working class people, they're gonna come in and go, hang on a minute, this isn't for me. And let me emphasize, this is not because people are being unpleasant or racist or whatever, you know, let's hope not anyway. It's just because they're different. And we're all like herd animals in that sense that we love to be with people that we like. And then, so it's those guys. And then also you might go out to, you know, rural Belgium, let's say, and go to a farming town. And those people don't want to join you because, you know, they think it's just those urban types. So you've got a geographical problem and you've got a class problem. It's the two things combined. So that's the paradox is, of political identity is political identity is great for getting going and it's a disaster for actually getting to scale so the biggest thing the biggest reason why extinction rebellion has been successful in the uk where it's a lot bigger than everywhere else and this is my central point is that we decided to go to the people first rather than just being buddy with all our mates in urban liberal circles let's say or radical circles so that had an actual concrete implication, which was we organised public meetings in village halls, town halls, small towns, you know, rural areas, and told people this standard talk, which is, we're fucked, 
We need to do civil disobedience, break the law, and there's a pathway to action, which is to come down to London and sit in the road. So that's three elements to it, which optimise mobilisation. People know that the truth is there, you know, which is terrible. So they've got tears in their eyes because, oh my God, you know, I never realised it was so bad. Number two, you show them like what has to be done about it, i.e. you have to have mass civil disobedience to get this job done quickly. And third, you know, next Thursday, there's a non-violent direct action training and off we go, you know, form an affinity group, go and break the law. So the next point I want to make, and this is a really profound point, which is, and I've said this in, in the other talks about the money, is the whole social, psychological, emotional structure of the Western democratic world is being transformed and arguably all around the world. But obviously I'm focusing on Europe and there's implications obviously for Australia and the United States. But it goes a bit like this is, initially we just thought that there was only a small demographic that were concerned about climate change, you know, because it was like an environmental issue, you know, it's about polar bears, it's about looking after the planet, you know, it's a typical issue, right? That's not the case anymore. We're now we're in this climate emergency. So this has transformed the potentiality for mass movement building. In other words, like farmers are not going to be able to farm in 10 years time, right? That wasn't the case 30 years ago, just trundle along and everything would be fine. But now that's an objective truth, right? I mean, it might be five years, it might be 15, but it's coming down the tracks, right? So that's a fact, that's the first thing. And the second thing is farmers aren't idiots, right? A lot of them know this, but they don't know what to do. So they're like, they're a massive resource for mobilisation, but all these urban political people are going, well, for 30 years, farmers, you know, didn't care about our issues, so what's the point of going to the farmers? Incorrect analysis. The correct analysis now is they're ready to be mobilised, right? So the UK has proved this. We went to these rural communities and what have you, and we've got farmers involved, we've got, you know, people that have never heard about the Green Movement, never heard about, like, the North Pole, right? They don't really even care about it. What they care about is the universal message, which is they're going to lose their livelihoods, they're going to lose their businesses, they're going to lose their communities, and their children are going to starve to death, right? This is what's coming down the line. Now, that is a universal message. So this is like the big sort of penny drops moment is, number one, if we're not going to get a mass movement, we're not going to get anywhere. So you're going to have to go to these guys anyway, because you're not going to fill it all up with liberal middle class people, because as everyone knows, like, yeah, 1% of liberal middle class people, radical middle class people will do stuff, but we also know loads of them just don't care because they've got too much skin in the game and, you know, you know how it is. So what we need to do is go and mobilise the 1% of normal people, which ha actually happens to be a far bigger demographic because you're talking about the whole country. So let's say there's 10,000 people in London that get it, but you can estimate that there's probably 100,000 people around the country who were ready to get it. I mean, there's still like 55 million people that aren't, but this is the next demographic to go to. Okay, so I want to be a little bit more specific about it to give it a bit more concreteness, is that the idea I want to put forward is, yeah, so the urban you know, radicals and what have you, we're mobilizing them, but there's this other group, and I want to be, it's not so much to common people, though obviously it is everyone, because it's a universal message, but the other major demographic to mobilise is the rural poor or the rural lower middle class, if you want to be technical about it. These are people that have enough time to think about what's happening in the world but and know, potentially know anyway, that it's over for them because there's not going to be no farming in the next 10 years and all the rest of it. So an example of this is, you know, I went to talk to some people in Turkey, right? They're in Istanbul, great guys, totally into it. But we were... After, after talking for about half an hour, I think everyone realised that the people that are suffering most from climate change are small farmers in eastern Turkey, where it's, there's been a drought for 10 years. So you've got this interesting thing where you've got two completely demographic, different demographics and never talked to each other historically, you know, for good reasons, because they don't really like each other and haven't got much to say, suddenly find some objective connectivity. And that's what needs to be brought together through, through these talks. And I'd, I'd give a little bit example of this, like from the UK, is a, another sort of demographic is, you know, small towns where not much go, is going on. And as people probably know, is small towns, people in small towns are moving to the political right because they feel left behind. So they're already what you might call alienated from the system. But if you go there and do talks, 
you find a lot more of them are willing to break the law and go to prison and what have you because there's not that much going on in their lives. So I can give you a few like figures here is if I go to sort of Brighton or London or whatever and I do a talk and I say afterwards you know how many people want to get arrested to go to prison they might find like five to ten percent. If I go to like you know let's call it a depressed you know English town like Scunthorpe or Sunderland or go to Wales to Carmarthen or something like that <coughs> then I find it's about 30 percent. So that's a bit of hard you know data there. And why is that? It's not because people are green or radical or right on or culturally acceptable. It's because they care about their kids and they haven't actually got that much going on in terms of skin in the game. So they're more prepared to go out into rebellion. So we're missing this massive trick here. Um, and I want to say something. This might go on to 20 minutes. Hopefully that'll be all right. I want to say something about specifically how to do it. Because I talk to people, you know, a lot about this, and I talk to people, you know, in Brussels and what have you, and they're going, yeah, 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 that's cool. You know, they get it. But then, you know, the big sort of, there's a big fear barrier, which is you go to some rural town in southern, you know, Belgium. I mean, how exactly do you do this? Which is a good question. You know, you don't just turn up and knock on the door of some community centre and say, hey, I'm doing this talk. But in actuality, that's sort of what you have to do. So there's a number of different ways. So I'm going to briefly go through them and, you know, you're going to have to try a few different ways. I mean, obviously you've got a database, so you can send an email out to all the people in that rural area, maybe within 20 square miles, and say, I want to do a talk in the town. Can you find me a community centre or a church? And, and so I can come along and do it. And could you publicise it a bit, you know, put posters up or something like that. So they'll do that for you. You just need to find one or two people in the region that will do it. Or the worst comes to worst, you could just go and do it yourself. And then you do a talk, right? So don't expect anything dramatic. Maybe only five people turn up. I mean, maybe more, so that's great. But let's say only five people turn up. It's not the end of the world, because those are your five local people. And then what you do is you headhunt, as it were, the two that have got their head screwed on, and they're going to be most likely embedded in that community, right? And you say to those people, look, you know, we didn't get many people here tonight, but we want to do it again in a fortnight. Could you, you know, spread it through your social media or through your offline mechanism, you know, ways? Because they're embedded in the local networks. And, you know, five times out of ten, you know, the next time you do it, you're going to have 20 people there. And then you headhunt your coordinators and then you get out of the space, you know, you train them or what have you, and then they're on the go. And they're going to then promote it, you know, according to their cultural references, you know, about what's happening with farming, what's happening to rural communities, you know, what's happening to rural incomes what's happening when, you know, there's no food and all the rest of it. So, and then you're on the go. So it's not a matter of sort of just strolling up and suddenly hundreds of people turn up. You're going to have to work on it a bit. But the main thing is just do it. Because through your failure, you'll actually work out how to succeed. So you might, you know, you might only get two people. It doesn't matter, you know, you'll get some data and you think, okay, I'll do it again and we'll do it slightly differently. And obviously, once you've got the local people involved, then they do it themselves because then it's like people like me you know because if I did it they're going to think mm, you know who's that person well if it's Mrs Jones from down the road you're going oh right you know this is and as as my tour showed lots of normal people are really animated about this so it, because it's this universal issue so I want to finish on this fundamental structural point which is it's a numbers game right so even if you know you don't really like this idea, let's say, and you don't really want to do it. No, you've got to do it because all those urban people are going to starve to death if you don't get the numbers on the street. In other words, if you don't sort this crisis out. So how do we do that? By getting thousands of people. What's the quickest way of getting thousands of people? Build a mass movement. What's the quickest way of building a mass movement is snot stop being snotty about people who aren't like you. Go out and talk to people you don't particularly like, don't particularly connect with. And dare I say it, it will enrich your life. You know, because as I'm sure many people know, when you start mixing with people who aren't like you, you'll learn a lot about the world. So, you know, there's a personal aspect to it as well. But at the end, end of the day, it's a numbers game. You need thousands of people on the streets of Brussels, Amsterdam, Paris, and this is how you're going to get it done. So, just do it. <laughs>